Welcome to our online worship service here at North Hassani Baptist Church. My name's Dan. I'm the associate pastor. And if you would, please go to our website, uh, nibchurch.com. Fill out that welcome card. Click on that link there and let us know where you're watching. Let us know if there's any way that we can uh, care for you uh, in the next week to come. I uh, want to let you know that we have right now media available at our church uh, if you are uh, a friend of North or attend regularly or are a member, uh, you have access to all, over 15,000 Bible studies and lessons available on Right Now Media. Uh, some of them even have downloaded uh, material to help uh, take notes or to follow along or to even teach some of the lessons there. Uh, they're available to you. By request, so send uh, a request to, to get connected with Right Now Media. To our church, uh, you can email that request, or if you're already on the welcome card, uh, you're welcome to click on the link there uh, that says, I would like to get Right Now Media, and we will uh, send you the information on how to get started uh, accessing all of those Bible studies. These are wonderful for small groups or for family studies or just individually uh, going through um, a study of the scriptures. And so we want you to know that these are available uh, if you're a member or a part of the North family. Uh, if you are looking for um, a new Bible reading plan in the new year to come, or uh, maybe you've never really attempted to read through the scriptures, uh, we want to be a help to you. Uh, we've selected uh, several plans, and they're available online at, uh, on our website at our ministries page. Uh, so if you're looking for a new plan, uh, or if you want to start reading through the scriptures, uh, there are about five different plans available on our website. Uh, go there, take advantage of that, and dig into the Word of God in this new year. Let's pray together before we continue in our worship service. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to gather. We thank you for uh, the goodness that you have given to us, all these resources to study your Word. Uh, and with that joy and seriousness, we look forward to studying your Word this morning. Uh, guide our hearts, guide our minds. May they be pleasing to you as we sing to you and as we learn from your Word. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
When I drive around, I see a lot of Christmas spirit around town. There are lights, inflatables, snow globes, nativities, numerous Santa statues. Uh, some people like the classy, simplistic displays. Others go all out. Uh, one of my favorite displays in my neighborhood, I honestly had no idea what they were doing until my kids let me in on, on what was going on. Uh, I would drive by this home and they would have purple and pink and white strands of lights around their trees. And, and it was typically, again, it wasn't the typical white, blue, red, or green, but, but I didn't give it a lot of thought. And another interesting dynamic of the display is that they never turned all the, all the lights on at once. It was kind of a gradual week-by-week -week thing. Now, I don't pay a great deal of attention to these things because I'm honestly too lazy to light up my own house, but my kids let me know what was going on. The family was celebrating Advent with their kids. But instead of candles, they were using lights around trees and they would turn one on every single week until they finally lit the Christ star on one of their, on one of their candlelit trees. Now, we haven't talked a great deal about Advent, and at previous churches I've pastored, we, we'd have a family give a short devotional and then, and then light a candle and, uh, when it was uh, each Sunday and then the final candle was lit on, at our Christmas Eve service. Now, some of you may know we have, we've been in Advent this season, but don't really know what the word Advent means. Now, some of us assume the word involves preparations, and certainly that's, that's a part of it, but literally the word means arrival or coming. And because the Sunday after Christmas occurs so shortly after the holiday celebration this year, I made the decision to include it in our sermon in our series called Rival Christmas. Now, we've been working through ways that we can celebrate the holidays in a way that will rival the world's celebration. We are in competition, but we fight differently than the world fights. We carry ourselves with love and compassion and the humility of Christ. We work on our inner lives so that what comes out of us when bumped is full of God's goodness and grace. But we have to be careful not to exhale. A rival Christmas should actually transition into, a, into living a rival lifestyle. See, and the advent of Christ's first coming should naturally transition into our hope for his second coming. Now, we're, we're, we're to renew the rivalry spirit even after Christmas. Now, this may sound random, but have you ever stopped to think about what the angels surrounding the throne of God repeat over and over? Uh, we sing it in an old hymn, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Now think about that last phrase, who was and who was and who is to come. See, when, when putting life into perspective, some will tell you that you need to look into your past or you'll be doomed to make the same mistakes. Others say you need to live in the present because you get caught up in either your past or your future and, and become worthless in the now. Others will tell you you need to look to the future because if you have a goal or a vision for the future, it shapes how your behavior will, will play out now. And again, I'm not saying that any one of these perspectives at time may be right, but again, we serve a God who was in the past, who is in the present, and is to come in the future. We see his faithfulness throughout history. We see his present provision right now. And we look forward with hope to a coming day when he will come again. See, it's those last two points that I want to spend our time on today. We want to focus on the advent that happens daily and the one coming in the future and how it changes the way that we live. And I want to start with a really, really important point, and that is, is that we will not be fully prepared for Christ's future advent if we don't take advantage of his daily advent. Good people generally wake up most mornings and hope to live good lives. Godly people wake up each morning and hope to experience the coming of, their, of the presence of their creator. See, Jesus left a promise. He would never leave us or forsake us. He promised us that if we remain in him and he in us, we will bear much fruit. His desire every day is to fill our lives with his spirit and produce within us the righteousness of Christ. But, that, but if that's his desire, why doesn't he just go ahead and do it? Regardless of how I act, why is it that when we try to pray and think about the things of God, our minds wander to the bills that need to be paid or the kids that need to be tended to or a job that needs our best effort? Why can't it just be like talking to another person, 
To answer that question, we need to take a journey back to my childhood. Now, I'm sure that you'd agree that TV has come a long way since our youth. With digital advancement, it's, it's rare to see a glitch. In my younger years, before the cable box, we had antennas. Sometimes, on the, uh, uh, at the end of the antenna, we would have foil attached to the antenna from the kitchen. Other times, the job of the child might be to hold the rabbit ears in such a way that dad might be able to finish his episode of Bonanza or Gunsmoke. Because of what Christ did on the cross, the connection between God and man has been restored. Praise God! But as long as we live on this earth, our antennas, corrupted by our flesh, just are always a little squirrely. It doesn't mean that God isn't sending a signal in high definition. It just means that what he says clearly we sometimes receive is static. Our flesh makes things tricky. But even with this being the case, that that, that communication is still an opportunity for our faith to grow. Even when we don't get crystal clear conversation with God, we still have the opportunity to trust in his word and to put into practice what he says to be true. And that's why the daily advent of Christ is so important. See, God came into the world, and that's incredible, but just as incredible as his desire to come into your life every day. That's why Paul, after spending 11 chapters in the book of Romans, fleshing out the theology of the gospel, he starts his practical advice to applying this truth by saying this, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he will find acceptable. This is a true way to worship him. Don't copy the behaviors and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. See, a daily advent starts with the renewing of your mind. Or as NLT puts it here, changing the way you think. The way that you change how you think is learning to know what God thinks. And that's why reading God's word is so important. It's why studying the words of Jesus and his teachings is pivotal to your growth. We have to know what Jesus thinks of us. We need to know what he thinks of our trials, what he thinks of our sin, the flesh and the spirit inside of us. Paul in Philippians encourages us to have our our thoughts fixed on things that are true and honorable and right and lovely, pure and, and admirable. The best place to find the thoughts of God is in the Word of God. And that's why the Word of God and the Spirit of God work together as we communicate with God. Now, I love preaching on prayer. In fact, I'm in the infant stages of our next series on the subject. But but in the past, I preached an entire series called Transforming Prayer. And one of the main thrusts of that series was to pray with your Bibles open. If you want a monologue where you constantly hear yourself speak, then then shut the Word of God. If you want a dialogue where God can speak to you, leave it open. Use the Psalms to spark your worship, the epistles to pray for God's coming kingdom in in the lives of those that you love. And the Sermon on the Mount is a great way to expose your sin and, 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 and help develop within you a life of confession. Then as you go throughout your day, you announce the Lord's presence by the way that you live and you work. Be careful. Again, don't compartmentalize your life into pieces. I did my devotional part. Now I need to go and make a living, right? No. Remember that your work is sacred as well. Because when you do what you do for God's glory and with his presence in mind, you bring him glory as you work with excellence, sacrifice for your coworkers, pay attention when people are struggling, and even as you make money and bring profitability to your company. You announce the Lord's second coming in the way that you live your life daily. As as Christ comes to you, then you go out to others. Never feel guilty for working a job uh, or a so-called secular job. When you are in Christ, everything that you do is an opportunity to bring in that which is sacred. But that's only one. But that's only two of the three advents. There was again the advent of Christ's first arrival, his daily arrival. But it's also important to remember his second coming as well. See, remember, Jesus is coming back again. Now, I don't often preach about the second coming of Christ. I certainly do when it comes up in the Gospels or the Epistles or or in Scripture as I'm doing something expository. I I did a series through through the book of Daniel that has us spending a great deal of time in in apocalyptic uh, literature. 
Now, I've yet to tackle the book of Revelation as a sermon series, but I, I may someday. But part of my hesitation in preaching through the last book of the Bible is the difficulty in interpretation. See, many people interpret the book with no regard to the type of literature that it is. Now, I can understand the Psalms because we still write poetry and compose music, even if their, their, their structures were different back then. I can understand the Proverbs because we still are pumping out wisdom literature. History was recorded in the past, and we still have history books today. Um, we can understand a letter being written to, to people groups and supporters. There is nothing in our modern literature that rivals apocalyptic uh, writing. It's fascinating, but it can also result in an unhealthy fixation, uh, fixation on, the, on the end times. Uh, there are some who are so passionate about their views regarding the end. If, if I were to differ in my personal thoughts on how the book should be interpreted, they might even leave the church, even if we're in line with our understanding of the gospel itself. There have been church splits over details of an event that we are called again and again to rejoice in as followers of Christ. Today's not a day to, to line out all of my thoughts on how and when the, the end will occur. I do, however, want to take a few moments and remind us that it's more important to be ready than knowing exactly when and how apocalyptic events will occur. Let's look back at the, the first coming of Christ during, during Christmas the people who should have been most aware of his arrival were the ones who were instrumental in his crucifixion. The wise men from the east, probably uh, in a lineage taught by Daniel, were more aware of what was happening at Christ's birth than the religious leaders only a few miles away. All of their debate and speculation did very little to prepare them for the coming of the Messiah. And this should give us a little bit of pause. It might be a good idea to ask yourself the question, do I spend more time and energy knowing what's happening in Israel and the Middle East than I do working out the righteousness gifted to me in Christ in my marriage, in my parenting, and in my workplace? Now there's a balance here. I'm not saying be oblivious or don't pay attention. Remember Simeon and Anna when Jesus was dedicated? Let me read that text for you in Luke. See, at the time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. And he was a righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him and had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day the Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present baby Jesus to the Lord, as the law required, Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms and praised God. Now listen. It must have been an incredible moment for Mary and Joseph to have this stranger take a hold of their child and prophesy over him. But that's not what I want you to notice from the text. Now look how Simeon is described. He was righteous, devout, and living in eager anticipation. The Holy Spirit was on him and he was able to listen to the Spirit's promptings. But he wasn't the only one. Let's read about Anna who followed right after Simeon. Anna, a prophet, was also there in the temple. And she was the daughter of Phanuel from the tribe of Asher and she was very old. Her husband died when they had been married only seven years. Then she lived as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple but stayed there day and night worshiping God and fasting and prayer. She came along just as Simeon was talking to Mary and Joseph and she began praising God. She talked about the child to everyone who, was, who had been waiting expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. She lived her life close to the presence of God. She stayed at the temple day and night, worshiping God with fasting and prayer. Did you catch a theme here? The ones who were prepared and ready weren't the scholars or the ones who led the seminars. It was those who lived in close relationship with God. They understood the Lord's presence and rejoiced in the promises of God. Again, that's not to say a person like that couldn't lead or even shouldn't lead a conference. I just think it's a good reminder that our primary task as we eagerly await the second coming of, of Christ is to be prepared. And both were, were prepared by the lives that they lived, but also eagerly anticipated the Lord's coming. So what are we supposed to do? So let's talk a little bit about application for this text. Uh, first, worship a God who was, who is, and who is to come. Now, 
the Bible is full of truth that brings us wisdom. Uh, I love the balance of the Old Testament bringing this, this thinking in. Uh, bring, I love the balance of the Old Testament um, when thinking about the Psalms and, and Proverbs and Job and Ecclesiastes and the Song of Solomon. Each point, each brings a point that's important to a perspective that, that on its own is somewhat limited. See, the Proverbs are not promises. They're general principles. When generally followed, will generally result in a blessed life. The book of Job reminds us that even if we do every single thing in this life right, that the proverb says there are forces beyond our knowledge and reasons for suffering, uh, needing our trust and dependence upon God. Uh, Ecclesiastes reminds us that even if we live the proverbial life and accumulate all of the blessings this world has to offer, we still end up in the same hole as those who didn't. It's all meaningless apart from God's presence in our life. The Song of Solomon gives us perspective on the type of relationship that God hopes to have with us. Our marriages are a shadow of a future relationship that we will someday have in Christ. And the Psalms remind us that that life isn't solely about thinking, but also about processing through our life, our disappointments and victories and questions with a posture towards worship. See, these five books create a balance in our lives and circumstances. If, and if you forget one, you can be in trouble. Think, about, think life is all about the Proverbs and you start to act like they're promises and will eventually grow disillusioned and disappointed. So I think as we prepare for the advent of Christ's second coming, there's, there's a similar balance and posture that we need to take. When the angels at the foot of the throne of God cry out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come, there seems to be an important tension, kind of similar to what I was talking about in the, in the Proverbs. But in these three statements, knowing and experiencing God's past, present, and future deliverance is key to being ready for the next advent. Most of you have, have, have met what I'll call the, the, Chris, the Christian of God's was. Now, their faith is always in the past. Maybe, maybe there was a great moment, a summer camp, a job, a men's group, or, or some other great religious experience or season. When you ask them about their faith, they will always point back to who God was back then. Or you may run into the, to the Christian of God's is. Initially, it might, it might take some thinking to figure out what could possibly go wrong living in the present, but the problem is twofold. Without the past shaping your present, you'll lack the rootedness and endurance necessary to live through trials. Past events of God's faithfulness, whether in our lives or the lives of others, can spur us on. And secondly, without future hope, trials have no perspective. The future advent of Christ should be our motivation. We endure not for a present hope that things will get better. The truth is it may not. If we fail to worship the God who will be, there's no no joy in our endurance. And then lastly, we can't be the Christian of of the gods is to come. Like Now, I'm creative and a visionary by nature. I love thinking about the future and what could be. And I find myself that I get in trouble at times and have gotten myself in trouble at previous ministry settings because I would paint these brilliant pictures of what could be to leaders without addressing what currently was going on. If you do that long enough, people get exhausted and, and little gets done. That's why as you're waiting for Christ's second advent, it's important to, along with the angels of God, Worship the God who was, who is, and who is to come. Let God's past faithfulness embolden your current decisions while finding joy in a day that will someday be. Lastly, regarding the future Advent, keep your lamps burning. Like Jesus tells a story about 10 young women, 10 young virgins in Matthew chapter 25. I'm going to read it for you. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough olive oil for their lamps, but the other five were wise enough to take along extra olive oil. When the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, they were roused by the shout, Look, the bridegroom is coming! Come out and meet him! All the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. But then the foolish ones asked the others, please give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. But the others replied, we don't have enough for all of us. Go and shop, go to a shop and buy some for yourselves. But while they were gone to buy oil, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast and the door was locked. 
Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, believe me, believe me, I don't know you. So you too must keep watch, for you do not know the day or the hour of my return. Now, our wedding celebrations are a little different than the events surrounding this parable. In ancient Jewish culture, when a young man had prepared his house and was ready to go and retrieve his bride, he was allowed by his father to go, and sometimes this was just across town, other times it was to a neighboring village, to bring his bride back and start the week-long wedding feast. Now, these ten young ladies were waiting in the groom's hometown for the procession to return, and often that would take a while. Because when the groom would get his bride, the trip back by the wedding party would be the longest route imaginably possible. Everyone wanted an opportunity to wave, to celebrate, to greet, and sometimes even just join the procession of the soon-to-be-weds. And any number of reasons could cause a delay, but apparently it was taking longer than normal. Weddings took, took place during the hot months, and so an evening celebration would be very normal with, with cooler temperatures. And if you were a woman out past dark, you would need a lamp, but not for the reasons that you might be thinking. Now, we tend to think of a lamp as the equivalent of the modern-day flashlight, right? When, when I read this text, we might even think five of the women were, were kind of being a little selfish. Like, why not just follow the ones who brought their lamps? There would be enough light to, to get you there, right? Right? A lamp for, but a lamp for women went much more than just a flashlight. See, Kenneth Bailey, who I've used in the Luke series, says this about the parable. It is one thing for young men to roam out uh, about at night without lamps, but women, young and old, always carried lamps. Their reputation, and in some cases, their personal safety depended upon those lamps. For young unmarried women to move around in the dark without carrying a lamp was unthinkable. What might they be doing in the dark and with whom? Also with the lamp, no one can harass them unseen. I have observed that village women do not carry their lamps conveniently close to the ground like a flashlight so that they can see the street. Instead, they carry them directly in front of their faces so that all can witness who they are and where they're going. Apparently, all ten of the ladies fell asleep with their lamps burning. Then, while they were dozing, the cry went out that the bridegroom had arrived and all should come and greet him. A woman joining uh, this procession would, would no more go out without a lamp than any one of you ladies would walk into a wedding ceremony in your pajamas. Five of these ladies had been caught. They forgot to bring extra olive oil to burn. They immediately demanded the other share, but they only had enough olive oil for themselves. And as they looked for oil and eventually found some, the door was shut and they were left outside knocking and hoping to be allowed in. And the groom looks out and says, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I know you. Now what happens next? We don't know. The response, like many of the parables in Jesus, is, is open-ended and left for the reader uh, and asking the reader, well, what will, what will you do? Are you staying diligent as the groom is delayed? Now, we celebrate the advent of Christ's first coming every year. But are you living in a way as to prepare yourself when the Lord comes again? See, the parable gives us a, a few sobering truths. The first is, you can't borrow someone else's oil. You won't be prepared solely by spending time with others carrying their lamps. You need to bring your own resources and own oil. Secondly, there is a, a door that closes that people will be on the other side of. See, there, is a, there will be unnecessary drama for some disciples of Christ who fail to remain faithful and diligent during their time here on earth. Jesus describes the drama in this parable. Paul uses another word picture in 1 Corinthians 3. He says, but on judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if the person person's work has any value. If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. See, are you living in a way that's leading to great drama or great excitement? See, salvation is a gift of God through faith. You don't earn your way into heaven. 
The invitations have already been sent out and secured, but how you prepare for Christ's second advent is important in determining how, we, how you will be received. That's why this sermon is about both the daily and the final advent of Christ. To be prepared in the future, we need to take advantage of Christ's desire to be present in our lives every day. May God himself reveal to you, empower you, and equip you so that on the day of his second appearing, you are ready, even though it feels like he's been delayed. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you again for this day. And Lord, I pray for a people, Lord, who keep their lamps trimmed and ready. Lord, that we, we use that light to look around, but also, Lord, we allow that light to fill our lives with all of your goodness, with, with the Holy Spirit's power. God, help us to be faithful each day of our lives. Lord, when we fail, Lord, let us receive your forgiveness by grace, but continue to put one step in front of the other as we walk down this trail called life. And God, as we stumble and fall, Lord, show your gracious provision in bringing us home to yourself. Lord, thank you that we are your bride. Thank you, Father, for your faithfulness in doing this. And I pray, Father, that each one of my friends, either listening to this or seeing it live, God will be impacted by the hope of your second coming. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.